Um, I'm Gil Tene, and I'm the CTO of Azul Systems. And this is a subject that I've been uh, involved in for a pretty long time because um, probably on the order of uh, 12, 13 years now. Um, but it's become very relevant in the last year or so in, in a very important way. Um, many people aren't quite sure what hardware transactional mean, uh, transactional memory means or what transactional memory means. The purpose of this talk is to understand what the capabilities are and what they mean to developers, to people who write software. What, how is the world changing in a way that matters to you uh, right now? Um, so I'll start with a brief introduction. Um, I'll explain what hardware transactional memory is um, and the kind that I talk about and the kind that is now available in every Intel server that you might be buying from here on. Um, I'll tie the hardware transactional memory capability to how it works, to how cache coherence in CPUs makes it possible, to what the mechanisms that actually make it work do. But we'll do it um, in a way that is important for understanding how the machine roughly works. Not so much for knowing how to build it, but for understanding a little bit of how to, how to use it. Um, we'll then look at what you can do with hardware transactional memory. For example, from a runtime like a Java virtual machine or a .NET CLR or any runtime that's out there, even um, synchronization libraries for C, C++. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about the capabilities there. And towards the end, we'll talk about the meaning of this to how you code, what, what it could do to your code that's positive, and what you can start thinking, what differences might be in how you think about your code and what considerations you have in coding once this feature is available to make the best use of it. So I'll start with a small introduction about me. I'm the CTO of Azul Systems, as I said. Um, at Azul, we build Java virtual machines. That's all that we do. We make um, two different actual JDKs. One is a, kind of a, our flagship product called Zing. It's, we think it's the best Java platform on Earth, the best JVM. Um, and we also make uh, Zulu, which is basically a, an open source, open JDK distribution. We, we build a binary everybody could download, use for free. Um, without having to build it themselves and obviously offer support and such. Um, one of the areas that I've worked a lot on in the last decade and plus is garbage collection. Because one of the things we're probably the best known for is garbage collection is no longer a problem when you run on Azul JVM. Um, and, and some evidence of me working on the subject of garbage collection could be seen here. This is me working on garbage collection in my kitchen. Uh, the machine that I'm sitting next to is called a trash compactor. This is a real thing, at least in California. Uh, the job of a trash compactor, it sits where the normal garbage can is, but it's a form of generational garbage collection for your kitchen. You perform minor garbage collection compactions during the week so that the full GC only happens once a week when you need to take the bag out and, and go to the stinky outside garbage can. But unfortunately, this wasn't working right. It had a bug in it. The compaction wasn't working. Fragments were being accumulated. We weren't compacting the heap right. And, and I had to open it and debug it. This actually happened. Um, and I thought it would be funny to take a picture with the garbage collection theory book next to me when I did that. And that's what you see here. That was 12 years ago. So I, I've been thinking this is funny that long. Um, but But... You know, garbage collection is not the subject for today, more of an introduction to some of the things I play with. Um, here's some evidence of what happens when you solve garbage collection. Uh, we like seeing this kind of effect because, you know, you no longer tune, you just, if the problem is gone, you could do other things like write better software, solve interesting problem, or just drink beer. Um, but I've worked on a lot of other things. Um, I've worked on all kinds of physical and virtual machines and, and operating systems. One of the things that I worked on is the first commercially shipping hardware transactional memory platform. 
Earlier in the history of Azul, we actually used to design chips and instruction sets and interesting monster hardware before Intel hardware became good enough to just make everything software for us. <clears throat> and we shipped the first hardware transactional memory capable piece of hardware anywhere. So in doing that, back in 2005, so 11 years ago, we learned a lot about the subject, which at the time was a kind of a niche subject which now seems applicable across everything. Um, so as I said, I've built a lot of things, and I also like to talk to people about all kinds of things that I think are important. This is an example. One of the subjects I talk a lot about is response time and latency and how we think about it and how we measure it and all the mistakes we all make. And that's a very depressing talk, but a useful one. Um, so that's enough about me. Let's look at the subject at hand. Hardware transactional memory, why are we here even talking about it? Why does it matter now? It's been an academic subject for about 20 years. Um, and the reason it matters is because it is now finally here. The world changed earlier this year in a very dramatic way when it comes to this capability. Now, hardware transactional memory has been around in various forms. As I said, we shipped our first systems at the end of 2004, early 2005, and that was the first hardware transactional memory hardware available. And variations of some PowerPC architecture for certain platforms had it, and some designs of Spark that never shipped had it. Um, but these are all uh, exotic, uh, corner, niche, small part of the worlds that had this. What's changed is that every commodity Intel server that you can get your hands on that was made after March of this year has this feature in it. Which means that as of now, you will see it in the hardware you run on without having to choose it, without having to select it. It's not an extra feature. It's just part of what Intel server chips do, period. Yep. Skylake has it, Broadwell has it, and even Haswell E7s have it. That sounds like a song. Birds do it, yeah. Um, so I actually listed the models of Intel chips that have this, but think of it this way. There are no new or current Intel server chips, not old ones, but new ones, that do not have this feature. It is everywhere. It is a commodity feature. It's you know, there for free. Um, some of, even on Amazon, the X1 instances already have it, and over time we'll see more and more just hardware just magically have it and that's it. So this matters because it's here, it's a new hardware feature, it is everywhere. So what does it do or what does it mean? That's what the talk is about. So what is hardware transactional memory? And I'm talking about a specific kind of hardware transactional memory, but it is the kind that's in the Intel chips. Um, so you can think of the main feature of hardware transactional memory as speculative multi-address atomicity. An atomic operation across multiple addresses of memory that is done without being sure it can actually be done, so speculatively. Um, you're probably very used to speculative single address atomicity, compare and swap, um, things like that. That's I think I can do this in one shot, but maybe it's wrong, so might fail, might not. But this is across many addresses and for a lot of operations. A transaction, this thing that can either happen or not, starts and ends with explicit instructions that say start the transaction, do stuff, and end the transaction in this form of hardware transactional memory. So there's a begin and an end instruction. Between the begin and end instructions, all loads and stores to memory are part of the transaction. There are no special load and store instructions. There are no instructions that says do this transaction or not. When you start the transaction, everything you do from now on is part of the transaction. When you finish it, you go back to normal. So the regular operations you already do are part of a memory transaction when this happens. In every memory operation that you have done, in a transaction that was successfully completed, meaning you got to the last instruction, you committed it, and it finished, all of this together appears to happen atomically to everything else in the world, to any other thread, to any other CPU. 
So whatever you do in a transaction, either all happened at exactly the same time without being able to observe something in the middle, or none of it happened. That's the natural quality of a transaction, not just for hardware. Now, if you fail, if you abort a transaction, if you don't complete it, all the memory operations that happen in it are invalidated, uh, erased. It, it looks like none of them happened. So if you run a transaction and you change 25 places in memory and it fails, nobody will ever see any of the changes. You can't see part of them or see only some of them. That's a simple explanation of what a transaction is in hardware transactional memory. It's simply the normal operations against memory that you do. Now, transactional memory in hardware ties strongly to how caches work. And this is more of an implementation detail. It doesn't affect what I said before, but it is important to understand the relationship between transactions and caches. And cache coherency is a capability that any machine that has shared memory between cores has to some degree. Transactional memory, interestingly, leverages cache coherence without having to change it in any way. The existing protocols, the existing mechanisms that have been around for a long time actually let us do this without changing anything in the system. It's simply a concern that sits between the CPU and its cache. No other CPUs are involved in hardware transactional memory. So I'm going to go a little into cache coherence and how this interaction works. And when you look at cache coherence, you need to look and understand a little bit of the protocols and what the states mean. And that can be messy, um, pun intended. Here's an example of a diagram of the messy protocol. You have state transitions and states and when things happen. You don't need to understand this. Here's the Moesi protocol that you also don't need to understand. Here's the MSI protocol you don't need to understand. We don't need to get into the details of how the protocols work and what all the state transitions are. What we need to understand is conceptually what the states mean and what may, might make us move between them and what the implications of doing that are. <clears throat> so, to understand a little bit about caches in this context, let's look at what a cache line in a CPU um, looks like from an individual CPU point of view. There are multiple states, I'll name four of them. The simplest one is I don't have a copy of this data. It's not here. The next one is I have a copy of, a, of this data in my cache but I don't know if it's the only one. Somebody else might also have a copy of this data. There's a state where I know I have the only copy of this data. Nobody else has a copy of it. It's here. And the last one is I have a copy of this data and I've changed it. So the copy I have is different than when I got it. These are the four basic states that are needed to, that you need to, to think about when you think of a cache. And if we name the states, this is technically called invalid. No, I don't have a copy. If I have a copy, but it may be somewhere else, this is the shared state in a cache. If nobody else has the copy, I have the only one that's exclusive. And if I have it and I've changed it, it is modified. Names, if we name these with letters, we get I, E, S, and M, or S, E, M. And if we just change the order, we get the messy protocol. That's what messy means. When you hear about messy caches, it's M-E-S-I. And then what makes you change between them? But fundamentally, what each one of them means is what you need to think of. Now, this has been around now for a long time. Any machine that has more than one CPU in it pretty much uses a variant of this to handle the fact that different CPUs need to work on data but see the same values and do it at speed. Hardware transactional memory takes this cache coherence state, adds a tiny bit of thinking to it, and makes transactions work. And it's, it's actually a brilliant exercise in doing this that when you look at it, you kind of wonder why hasn't it been, been done before? Because it's not a system thing, it's a local CPU thing. So the, con the concepts we add to, hard to regular cache coherence for hardware transactional memory look like this. If a cache line was accessed while I was speculating in the middle of a transaction, after the start but before the commit, then I track the fact, the CPU will track the fact on the cache line that it was speculatively accessed. So if we read it 
during the speculation or we changed it, wrote to it during the speculation, we track the fact that this is a, a cache line that was part of the transaction. So each cache line has that as additional state. If a transaction completes, if you get to the end of a transaction successfully, um, what we do is we clear all the speculation state. But interestingly, if you get to the ends of the transaction not successfully, you also clear all the speculation state. So cache lines are only in the speculative mode while you're in a transaction. When the transaction is no longer active, none of the caches are in a speculative state. If we get to the end of the transaction um, and we commit, all we have to do is forget about speculation. But if we have to abort, we, we basically have to get rid of the state that we wrote, and that means invalidating the caches that were written. So an abort in a transaction actually means take all the cache lines that were uh, written to in the transaction and invalidate them, just erase their copies. We know nobody else has a copy. So if we just get rid of what we did, nobody will see what we did. Now this other point here is that all these cache lines that are speculatively accessed are fine and nothing happens wrong in a transaction as long as we don't lose track of the cache line, as long as it's still in our cache, still in a state that is okay. If we lose track of any cache line that was accessed during the speculation, we have to abort the transaction. The actual safe part of the transaction is knowing that every line that I've actually accessed in, this, in the transaction is still in a valid state for the transaction. And that is true as long as I have it. If I, for some reason, can't keep track of it anymore, we must abort. The opposite of this is if I can reach the commit without having lost track of any of them, any of them all I need to do is clear the speculative state and the transaction is complete. So what does losing track of a line mean? How can you lose track? Well, here are simple things of, that make you lose track of a, of a cache line. The first one is some other CPU is trying to write to a cache line that you used in a transaction. So you have it here in your cache line, in, in your cache. You might have read it, maybe you wrote to it, and some other CPU wants to modify it. That would be a problem for the transaction. It won't be atomic. But to do this, the other CPU would first need to make it exclusive in its cache to be able to write to it. And to make it exclusive in its cache, it would somehow have to make it leave your cache. Before anybody can write to a cache line, it has to be exclusive to them, which means it cannot be in yours. That's a simple quality of all uh, shared caches with messy-like protocols. So it doesn't matter how they did it, before they can write, I will no longer have a copy. So that's a, that would make me lose track of the line. I have to get rid of it, invalidate it, forget it, change its state somehow. And that means I can detect that I need to abort the transaction before somebody else writes. The other case is that some other CPU wants to read from a cache line that we have already modified in the transaction. Now, note that this is only something that conflicts with modifications. If I've read a cache line and it is sitting in my cache in a shared state, and I access this speculatively, as long as it's still in my cache, everything's okay, Somebody else could also get a copy and read it, transactionally or not. It doesn't conflict with my transaction. As long as they don't need to modify it, we can all have copies. But if I did modify this cache, and somebody else wants to read it, and I haven't yet finished the transaction, that means I have to move from an exclusive mode to a shared mode and lose track of the line that was speculatively accessed. That would force an abort. So those are the two simple cases to think of, of how other people reading and writing data can make our transactions fail. The last and most common case of why you might lose track of a cache line is simple, it's capacity. The cache has a limited size, and if we tried to, in one transaction, modify a terabyte of memory, we will probably not be able to fit it in the cache. Something would have to be evicted. I will lose track of some data, and it will fail. So transactions are inherited limited, inherently limited to the capacity of the caches that hold the state, whatever the, those caches are in the CPU. Now that's it for the memory part. 
It is very simple. Because the messy protocol is there, because the states are there, we can simply define these behaviors and do transactions with the memory. We've done it 12 years ago. Intel's done it, well, they've worked on it for longer than 12 years, but it's now shipping. Um, so that's it from a memory perspective. Now, there's another detail. For example, in Intel, the transactions also include the CPU state, which is a very convenient feature. When you start the transaction, the CPU architectural state, everything about it, the registers, the addresses, whatever, the flags, they're all kind of checkpointed. And when you abort the transaction, you jump to a place that handles the abort, and that place is actually the parameter to the beginning. So you actually say, start a transaction. If you fail, go there. It's, that's what a begin is. When you abort, if you abort, one register is modified to indicate something about the abort, some conditions about the abort, some bits, and maybe a parameter if you explicitly abort. So a begin operation actually looks like a conditional jump to a fail that modifies one register. All the rest of the architecture stays exactly the same. Nothing has changed. So if a transaction fails, the only thing that was modified was the EAX register. So a transaction is an instruction that affects one register. Lots of instructions affect one register. It's a simple operation to think of that way. This is a very useful feature because it means that in software, we don't have to maintain and keep anything, say, save stuff because I'm starting a transaction so I can get back to it. All you have to do is start the transaction. If we fail, go there. That's at least what we do in the low-level software. So that's what hardware transactional memory does. It's not that complicated. It's a little bit of plumbing. But the obvious question is, what is it good for? What can you do with this? So what can you do with hardware transaction memory? Well, obviously, it's to transact on memory. And one of the brilliant inventions, I think, in the last 20 years on this space is called speculative lock elision. Um, the notion of hardware transactional memory in one way or another has been around since about 1993, at least in academic documents. Uh, but this discovery, I would say, happened a few years later, and it's basically the realization that we can use hardware transactional memory to avoid locking locks, but look like we did. Uh, the name that was given to it is speculative lock elision. Elision means avoiding or or not doing. And there's a PhD thesis by a guy named Ravi Rajward that basically coined this term, talked about it pretty much for the first time. Um, I made a little note here. There was actually a set of independent work that happened at the same time, published only months apart at a different university that has similar things. But this is the one that probably more closely resembles the terminology we use. Ravi went on to work at Intel, and this is what we got. Okay. Now, I first noticed this thing. Uh, this is an email that I dug out of my email archive from 2002. So I first noticed this in March of 2002, when at Azul we were looking at cool things we could do in hardware design. And I saved this email, and I'm very happy I did, because this is exactly the email not edited. You see, it says, speculative lock elision, wow. This can change the world, right? Now, down here, what I'm saying is this sort of speculation can facilitate an amazing improvement in the thread concurrency that code uses, that code that uses conservative, non-performance optimized synchronization can have. Meaning, existing code with existing locks can get much higher concurrency on new CPUs if this actually works. It is a pretty amazing thing. Now, how does this work, or what can we do with it? To, to understand that, we need to think of what we have in locks and what bothers us in lock. What, what is the purpose of a lock, and what's in our way? A lock is pretty much a traffic cop or a traffic uh, synchronization mechanism that prevents collisions on data, prevents bad things from happening. Think of it as a traffic light where 
when I have the lock, I have the green light and everybody else has a red light. And later I let go of the lock and the light switches and somebody else has the green light and I have to wait. And we switch back and forth and back and forth, right? But what we actually want to do when we have a lot of CPUs is for everybody to be able to work at the same time. We want green everywhere. There's a problem with giving everybody the green light. This sometimes happens, right? Now, when that happens with our state, we corrupt the memory, data gets all bad, math doesn't work, so that's a problem. So we need some way to prevent that, and a lock is a simple conservative way of saying, make sure this doesn't happen by doing only one thing at a time in a critical section. What we want is to be able to do the green-green light without that collision ever happening. What we actually want is a time machine. We want the ability to say, if a collision happens, roll the clock back, make it so none of what we did happens, then do the slow synchronized thing. But if no collisions happen, we could just keep going. And hardware transactional memory with speculative lock collision basically is the, is the operation of doing that. Now, I'm going to switch the slide background here intentionally to a different color. And the reason for this is the set of slides that I'll have, about 10 slides after this, were originally written uh, for a presentation I gave in 2005. And the funny thing is when I prepared this presentation, I was looking for, I've worked on this before, let's look at my old material. And I said, wow, it's, it's 11 years old and I can use the slides exactly the way they are because finally they're actually relevant, right? Um, I gave this presentation at Jau, uh in, in Denmark along with Ivan Posva, at the time worked at Azul. He went on to Google and built stuff like the V8 virtual machine. Um, but here's what we said then, and exactly that, verbatim word by word, applies now to current hardware and current JVMs, not just ours. So there, there's a new JVM capability that improves multi-threaded application scalability, and it can affect the way you code and you need to know about it, right? Um, why do we care about it? And we're going to go through these subjects. Why do we care about it? The simple reason is um, AMDA's law is one of the simple ways to think of how scalability is affected by synchronization or serialization of code when you have more than one CPU, more than one thing that could do work. The, the, the equation for, their, for it is there, for efficiency, but visualization usually helps. These are these are lines of efficiency behavior as you grow processors, depending on the percent of code that must be run serialized. Think of it as the percent of the time you spend in a lock out of overall time. So obviously, if you don't spend any time in any synchronized code, you'll have perfect efficiency. If you spend only a little time, it'll be still pretty, pretty good. But as you grow the percentage of time you spend in efficiency, in, in synchronization, the efficiency drops dramatically as you grow the number of CPUs. A different way to look at it is from a point of view of it's the same data, but how much more work do you get to do as you grow the number of CPUs? The perfect scaling line would grow linearly. Uh, but as you have even 5 or 10 percent of, of serialization, you get this flattening out and a complete inability to use CPUs above a few, right? It, they don't contribute to the work because they all wait in line. Now, this is somewhat intuitive, but some of that the intuition often misleads us as to how bad it is. It's worse than you intuitively think because, you know, obviously if I said I have 10% of the code that is serial, I have to do just 10% of the code one at a time, you know that you, can, you can't do more than 10 times the work of one CPU because 10% has to be done one at a time. That's intuitive. But what's not necessarily intuitive is that with 10 CPUs, we don't get to do the whole 10x work. We only get to do 5.3x. And you have numbers like 16 and the rest there. And the more CPUs you have, the, more you, the, the, the closer you approach to the theoretical 10x speed. It will take an infinite number of CPUs to do 10 times the work. Okay? So the impact, like when you think 10% serialization, 10x is the best I could do, well, you know, with 10 CPUs, you only get 5x. So this is a big impact. And 
when we started looking at this, normal machines had two and four, maybe eight cores in them, and this wasn't a big deal. We were building machines with hundreds of cores we really cared. Now my laptop has eight cores in it. And I can rent a machine on Amazon for $10 an hour, and it has 128 cores in it. This is commodity, right? Tens of cores are in any, every server, so all these numbers are very relevant. So why do we care about synchronization and what can we do about it? Um, we see that synchronization has a bad effect on scaling and the ability to use multi-core machines, which are all machines now. Even my phone has four cores. Um, but when we look at why we synchronize, it's important to distinguish between lock contention, serialization in a lock, and contending on actual data. The reason the, the contention on a lock is the situation where two threads are trying to grab the same lock, um, so one of them has to wait for the other, right? That's what lock contention means. If I grab the lock and let it go and somebody else grabs the lock and lets it go, that's not contention. It's when we collide in time. Data contention, at least the way I'm defining it here, is when two threads try to access the same data in a way that needs to be atomic or clean and not interfered with for correctness at the same time. So I'm looking at a counter and I count up by one and then somebody else counts up by one on the same counter, that's fine, that's not contention. But if I'm looking at a counter and count up by one and at the same time somebody else looks at the same counter and counts up by one and we both write the plus one, we will actually lose a count and that would make it incorrect and banks uh, Try not to lose track of money, for example, which is why this is important. Um, so these are two different types of contention. Data contention is the actual thing we're trying to deal with. Let's not do wrong access to data. Lock contention is an artificial thing that says, let's grab this thing and do it one at a time. The purpose of lock contention is to prevent data contention. Because we usually have a problem with data contention and detecting it. So since we can't say, did we both access the thing at the same time? Did we do it right? What we do is we say, you will never access this thing at the same time because we'll put a lock on it. So if you have to have the lock to access the data, we know that there's no data contention. Now you can think of data contention in data structures in a counter, it's simple to think of it, but in a larger data structure like an array or a, ca or a, a hash map, Reading is not contention. Two things reading can see fine things together. Um, readers and writers to the same data structure also don't necessarily contend because I could write here and you could read there and we didn't change anything wrong. Even two writers to the same data structure are not necessarily contending because maybe they're writing different things. Obviously, when I only have one bit of data, that, that will contend if I write to it. Um, the purpose of synchronization is to get correct execution on these data structures. Um, and, the, and the reason we put it there is we don't have any good way to say, make sure we don't contend on data. From a, you know, how do I know if I did or not make the data non-contended? So because we can't tell if we're going to contend, we prevent the contention, as I said. That actually means that in correct code, lock contention is always more frequent than data contention. As long as you don't have bugs, if you're locking to protect the data, you better contend on the locks more frequently than you contend on the data without the locks. In practice, lock contention is a lot more frequent, as in 10, 100, 1,000 times more frequent than actual contention. Imagine that I have a a dictionary with a million entries in it, and I synchronize it just in case two things access the same entry. The chances that they'll access the same entry is very low, but I will contend on the lock every time. And it's exactly this relationship that we're trying to leverage here for synchronization with uh, transactional memory. It's the fact that when we play the screen and red light thing, if we let the two green lights happen, most of the time collisions won't happen, but unfortunately we can't roll the clock back, so we have to do them one at a time. 
Now, when we look at transactions, this is not a, something new. It's, it's been around forever. Um, databases and other things have also done transactions, looked at the scaling problems around them, and have also dealt with speculative transactions. Start a transaction, try to complete it at the same time in different places, and be able to roll back if you fail because of concurrency. Optimistic concurrency works most of the time or some of the time in the right places, right? So we can re-execute things, and this actually works. Speculative lock elision is a very similar concept, but it's a way of doing it tra it's transparently for existing uh, systems. So let's take this and talk about, you know, if we could create a transaction using that HTM feature that's kind of like what databases do, but transparently, magically, to your code without changing it. What would that look like? So the thing that we focused on is taking the basic synchronization feature of Java, which is a synchronized keyword block method, and making it transactional. And understanding why you can make it transactional depends on understanding that there is actually no lock involved in a synchronized block. I like to say this, there is no spoon, you know, from this movie. Or you can think of Yoda saying this. Um, what does synchronized actually mean in Java? It doesn't actually mean grab a lock, do this, and let go of the lock. That's just one way of implementing what it means. Synchronized actually means take this block that is executing under the synchronized keyword and run it so it'll look atomic to everything else that synchronizes on the same object. So if I synchronize an object O, and I do something, and you synchronize an object to O and do something else, we will appear atomic to each other. That's what synchronized actually means. And if you do that by grabbing a lock on O and doing it and letting it go, you will achieve that trivially. That's why we do locks. But this requirement can actually be satisfied by a more conservative statement that says, make this look atomic to anything else in the world regardless of what lock it's holding regardless of what monitor it's, it's, what monitor it's synchronizing on. And that looks a lot like a transaction. So we're going to use synchronized, the synchronized keyword in Java and use a hardware transaction operation to execute it instead of grabbing a lock. Um, the basic requirements I need to be able to do that is I need to be able to detect if data contended while I was doing the synchronized block and I need to be able to roll back the state to the beginning of the synchronized block, make it look like none of that work happened without changing the software, without the software being involved. And you can do this if the JVM uses the transactional memory feature in the hardware to basically execute the synchronized block. Now, the, the, the JVM already has... Um, optimizations for synchronization that have been around for 15 years or more, actually more. Um, for example, the JVM recognizes that synchronized blocks could contend sometimes very rarely, so you could do fast operations as long as they don't contend, and slow operations only if they contend, you know, just the CAS, but if there is contention, go block in the operating system. That, that's already there. So uncontended synchronized blocks are fine. Data contended synchronized blocks, the ones that actually access the same data and fail the transactions, well, those we actually have to do one at a time, right? We can't magically keep doing this. They might always collide. So we have to actually block. But if we have synchronized blocks without actual data contention, then we can run them concurrently without them waiting for each other. So these are the three main modes. If there is no contention, just run fine. If there is contention on the data, run serially like you run everything today. But if there's contention on the monitor but no contention on the data within it, run concurrently. All this is transparent. The JVM does it magically, and you don't have to change any Java code to make it happen. Nested synchronized blocks work fine. Synchronized inside synchronized methods. You don't have to think of the structure of this to make it work. And this does reduce serialization in a, in a large way. And basically, you can think of it as moving the Amnaz law effect from affecting your code according what percent of the code is locked to the percent of the code that actually contends on data. 
So it shifts the coefficient for Amdahl's law, or the constant for Amdahl's law, from log contention to data contention, and we're hoping that data contention is a lot less frequent than log contention. From an implementation point of view, thin locks, these optimizations are still the same, thick locks that have to block us are still the same, but we add this additional state of transactional state to a monitor, and really the magic here, the interesting thing for a JVM to do is to figure out which of these states the lock needs to be in. That's where you'll see differences in evolution over time of how we learn whether this lock should be thin, thick, or speculative. But this is all magic that happens under the hood. Now, measurements, these are actually 11 years old measurements, and they look exactly the same with the same CPU numbers today. For example, if you look at data contention in a hash table, that with one global lock, you can have readers, writers, and these scenarios. And um, that's no contention. This is what data contention would look like. Here's a, a hash table scalability test with zero writes. It's a read-only hash table. It should have perfect scalability because there is no data contention. And you get pretty much perfect scalability if you do speculative locking and no scalability or very low scalability if you don't. Um, this is the same thing with 5% writes. So it's not read-only, just things scale very well even if you write. And if you write you know, 5% into a large hash map, that works just fine. See, that works up to tens and higher threads. The numbers here are micro benchmarks. They just show you mechanism actually works. Um, what happens in actual transactions becomes much more complicated, and actual applications becomes complicated. But with the time um, we have left here, what I want to do is cover the next thing, which is given that this is going to magically appear in the things that write, run your code. And by the way, today, RJVM Zing uses this feature on hardware that has it, and also Hotspot uses this feature on hardware that has it. It's had the capability to do this since 8U40, I believe. Um, I think you have to turn on a flag to use it there. But it uses this feature to do a transparent synchronized block without you having to do anything. The differences between us are more about the heuristics used to figure out how to stabilize the monitor and the lock and, and get it right so it only benefits and doesn't hurt. And, and I do like to kind of give people the right expectation. Since it's a new feature, those heuristics are still being learned for what it really means for real applications and real hardware in a mass market. Uh, so they will evolve. Um, we think that our experience from 10, 11 years ago is very applicable here. It took us a couple years of getting it right 10 years ago. We just took the same algorithms and used them now. They seem to work well. But it's mostly about being able to learn for each lock what the right thing is to do. Much like for each lock you have to decide whether it should be thin or thick, we also learn whether it should be speculative. But what does this mean to your code? What do you need to do? Do you need to change anything? Well, you don't have to change anything. Your code will work the same way. It's not going to get any worse if the JVM does its job right. However, for your code to benefit from this, because this is a new capability that might make you go faster, there are some interesting things to consider. And that's all. I'll give, give you some thought exercise here with code. Let's look at a simple hash table implementation. This is a very simplistic one. It's one hash table. Synchronized globally, not a lock per bucket or anything. You know, think of hash map with one synchronized block. On it. And the hash table works fine with buckets and non-contention on readers and writes in a bucket, but unfortunately, mo most hash tables will track the size of the data in them. So every time I write to it anywhere, I could have a million buckets, but I have this size that says how many total objects I have. And that thing right there is data contention on one variable every time I grab the lock. Because of this, all writers to this hash table will contend. Because there's one piece of data at least that they all modify, so they can't do it concurrently. Okay? That one line prevents us from scaling with transactional memory on a simple hash table implementation. So you, if this is your current code, the readers will scale, but the, and the readers versus writers might scale, but two writers cannot run at the same time. So we're going to walk through what can we do to improve it. I'm trying to make it better, and what you need to be thinking of now is 
not how to reduce log contention, but how to reduce data contention, because that's what's actually causing serialization. So I want to reduce the contention on this one variable. The obvious way to do that is to stripe the variable. I already have many buckets. Instead of having one size for the whole hash map, I'll have a size per bucket. By doing that, if I write to two different buckets, I'm not contending for the same size variable. I enable more concurrency. If I do write to the same bucket, it's still collision. And if I have a million buckets, that gives me a good likelihood of two writers being able to run at the same time. So we do it by striping the array and changing the size function from just returning size to adding all the sizes up. So this does solve the data contention problem. Unfortunately, it makes the size method really slow. Every time you want to know the size, I have to add a million numbers up. That's not great. So I solved one problem, but I created another. So the next thing we'll do is say, OK, what can I do here to improve the thing I just made bad? Well, I can cache the size. So if you ask the size over and over again, I don't have to recompute it. I only recompute it if it's been modified since the last time you read it. That way, yes, there's a long loop that adds things here, but it only needs to be recomputed if somebody actually changed the size. That makes the size function faster again, maybe not as fast as before, but in most cases fast. However, to cache the size, I have to have something that invalidates the cache, and I write here, every time I write to it, I, I clear it, but I just move the data contention back there. Right? So yeah, the size is striped and the size is cached, but I have this indicator that the cache is invalid, and now I contend on the indicator. So this seems like a back and forth losing proposition. However, this contention is happening because I write to the cache indicator, to the cache stuff. And I only need to write to it to invalidate. If it also is already invalid, I don't need to say that it's invalid again. If I put an if in front of that, I say, if the cache is valid, then invalidate it. Then I only write to it to invalidate it. So if I have a million writes, there'll be one to invalidate. The trick here is reading is not contention. Only writing is contention with other things. So by moving the invalidate thing to be more rare to write, I protect it from data contention for a transaction. And in doing that, I now have a situation where if I have a lot of writers to different buckets, they won't contend. If I have a lot of reading of the size over and over again, it won't be slow. There is still the situation where if you interleave writers and readers, there will be writers in size. Then every time you write, you have to recompute the size. So it's not as good as with, it's not perfect. But this is a dramatically better concurrent behavior than what we had before. And it's simply by shifting a tiny bit of behavior there. So this code works correctly in all of these implementations. The original one works. But if you want features like we have now that enable these transactional blocks to actually take effect, um, this is the kind of thinking you need to start applying. Where do I have data contention and what can I do to reduce it? Okay. There are some things intuitively, by the way, that you shouldn't attempt to improve. Counters always contend. Striped counters make not, so that might work well. Um, queues always contend. Um, anything that does I.O. or operating system calls, that cannot be done transactionally. Don't even try. But when you are looking at data structures, there's some simple things you could do to improve the, the natural ability of things like a JVM to do this. Now, um, it's not just JVMs that'll do it. I gave you an example in a working JVM. There are two JVMs at least that do this now. But this is a hardware feature that you will see any VM use probably in the future. And probably, not just probably, the POSIX locking libraries are actually going to use it too. So there's going to be a lot of attempt to transactionally uh, address locks for concurrency without changing the software. There are probably going to be attempts to expose APIs to using the transactions directly as well. But I actually think, I'm opinionated in this, but I think that direct APIs are going to be really rare. It's going to be more libraries and runtimes and JVMs and things like that that uses for software that just does regular locks that we're going to see. So we're good on time, then. Yeah. To summarize, 
Hardware transactional memory is here. This is news. It was not here a year ago, and now it is. This is changing the world quietly, but importantly. Um, you should expect the use of speculative locking in multiple different parts of software transparently on your behalf. So JVMs, all runtimes are probably going to evolve to do this, and libraries as well. Um, hardware transactional memory has other uses. I mostly focused on speculative lock elision, which is a very cool use of it. But it might be useful for other things. We're working on some really cool other things that might be able to use the same feature. And I kind of expect people to invent all kinds of weird stuff with it. Right? We now have a time machine that we can use from software that rolls back the time when we don't like what happened. That's a very, very useful feature, and we will find really cool things to do with it, I'm sure. So with that, I believe we have about nine minutes. Are we right? Yeah, for Q&A. So perfect. Um, so I'll take questions from the Just, audience. Yeah. Hi. So from your experience, you told that uh, with synchronized blocks in Java, they are really pessimistic because they, they lock the whole function and not just the, the races. So from your experience, uh, how, how many of the synchronized methods of the standard library, for example, do really fit in a transaction? Because you told that the transaction mm -hmm. is limited in space, especially today with the first implementation. So how, how much us re really can use this feature? So, so I'll address the question in two parts. Uh, the first one is, is the experience that um, that synchronized blocks tend to be coarse and fat. And I wouldn't say that that's necessarily the experience. We see all things. So synchronized blocks around simple, around large data structures that are done simply are usually big and fat. You have a data structure, but you don't want to deal with concurrent algorithms in it, so you just put a lock on the whole thing. But then you have things like concurrent hash map. Let's say I don't want to have a lock on the whole thing. Let's lock each bucket separately. And then you have other things like more concurrent hash maps, like you know, other algorithms that do things with no locking or with attempts to atomics or things that do STM, software transactional memory like techniques. So there are lots of variants, and depending on what libraries you use and what your data structure is, they might happen. But going back to the premise that there is code out there that has fairly coarse grain locks, and this will help it, hopefully, uh, how much and what would it do? Um, again, I, I, it's really hard to paint with a broad brush here and say, oh, this is the percent that things will happen. But transactions can be surprisingly long. Um, we have collected a lot of data on this, and um, there are two things that make transactions fail. Contending with something else, that's a timing thing. That strongly depends on how you use the stuff. But the other one is the capacity. How much code and data can I run? that could even do this, regardless of contention. And it turns out that if you, if you look at the capacity, say uh, the L1 cache of, uh, of an x86 CPU is 32 kilobytes of data in it. You can actually transact on 32 kilobytes of access data. As long as you didn't evict any of it, you could, um, or up to that. And that's a lot. You can run thousands of transactions, tons of instructions in one transaction and complete. You can make nested calls that are 10 deep and come back and still complete. None of those things run you into a problem. However, there are interesting sensitivities and new noise. So that 32K cache is eight ways that associative. So while you could actually fit 32K of transactionally access data and still complete, there is a combination of nine addresses that will make you fail every time. Because the cache can only hold eight different addresses that happen to align the right way in memory, and if you access nine different things that align with each other on a set in the cache, then you have to evict one of them. So it could be as small as nine, it could be as big as 32K. Uh, and it could be anything in the middle. From an experience point of view, uh, when we did this with Vega, we did collect a bunch of data from customers, um, and it was very, um, it was all over the place. Some things it helps a lot with. You could see a 50% improvement in concurrency and scale, 2x improvement. Some things it doesn't help at all. 
the main thing we spent about a year or two working on and stabilizing after we first shipped it is to make it so it never hurts. So it's not sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. It's sometimes it's good, sometimes it does nothing. Because if you get to that point, you can turn it on by default. It can only do good things. It cannot slow you down. And the art to doing that was making the actual monitors learn individually whether or not that monitor should even try to speculate. If you put a monitor around a log file, it will always fail. There's an I.O. down there or there's a serialization of access to it. If you are contending, there is no point in speculating. You're just wasting your time. But if you learn that pretty quickly after you try three or four times for that log file and you never do it again, then it doesn't hurt. Failing is pretty quick. And then you just don't waste your time doing it. So th that evolution is, for us, from an algorithm point of view, it's already there. But as I said, this is a new hardware feature. The situation of this being available in a commodity environment with mass marketability for all Java software in the world is new. And we don't yet have enough feedback data to know how much of that software is positively affected by it. So I don't want to overpromise here. I could give you demonstrations of 100x improvements. I don't think that's what will happen to programs. Okay. Long answer there, I guess. Right there. And I think we had a question after that over there, too. Uh, does this feature work or will work with Java 2 concurrent lock? Um, could you repeat that? Uh, does this feature work, uh, feature work or will work uh, with Java 2 concurrent lock? Oh, with Java 2 concurrent locks? Um, right now, we do not transact Java Util concurrent locks. But that's a right now statement. It is possible to do those two. Um, the, the reason for the difference is um, synchronized has some nice qualities that make it very easy to do this. Uh, a synchronized block is required by the language to be balanced. You can't grab it here and release it there. You can't grab it at this level in the stack and release it there. So it's just easier to map to a transaction. Uh, but that, that's not to say you can't do the locks in Java Util concurrent lock. The GVM understands them, can intrinsify them. We can map them to a similar thing. Um, and it may very well be profitable to do that too. Over time, we're going to find out. I think that statement is also true for what Hotspot does. I haven't checked, but I believe I, what I just described is what Zing, our JVM, does. But I believe that Hotspot uh, is the same way. They transact synchronized, but not, um, not re-entrant lock, for example. Yeah. Uh, hey, I guess oh, I get to go you next are. here. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of clarifications. The lights are in my eyes. It's hard to see. Yeah, yeah no problem. So uh, is it typically L1 that's the, the limit? I mean, it's... It ah. Um, what's the limit? In Vega, which we designed, I know exactly how it works. It was the L1. We transacted an L1. If it fit an L1 and didn't evict, it was fine. If we ever had to evict an L1 line, that was failure. Um, I don't actually know what x86 does, because that's not documented. It's architecturally, it describes what the functionality is, but it's not locked down to using L1 or L2 or L3 or store buffer combinations. Um, empirically, it looks like it's at least the L1. So capacity-wise, it looks like it's at least L1. There's some interesting papers out there, some actually really cool papers, about trying to um, empirically determine what cache it is by playing games to see what transactional capacity is and seeing what is that big, uh, whether it's the L1, L2, L3. I'm not sure how accurate those predictions are, so I'm not going to quote them. But it's usually L1 at least. It's not very useful to do this on very small numbers. And, uh, and yeah. just a couple more quick uh, very quick, quick things. Uh, the, the transactional synchronized, it's actually transacting over all data touched there or just the lock bits or something? So transactional synchronized transacts over everything you do in the, within the synchronized block, including any nesting that you do. Okay. Um, the trick to speculative lock elision is not modifying the lock, which is, that's a really brilliant observation that Ravi had. It's, Normally, when you grab a lock, you modify the lock, then you modify again to let it go. If you do that, you will fail the transaction. The cool thing in a transactional lock is you don't modify the lock, you just read the lock, verify it's not locked. And by doing that, you've made sure that anybody that tries to grab the lock that actually modifies it will make you fail. 
So by not actually changing the lock, you're able to do the lock concurrently. If you ever try to change it, you're going to fail. Anybody that fails the transaction and decides to say, I'm not, this, this speculation doesn't work, let's grab it to go serially, will make all the speculators fail to make room for him. And that works perfectly as well. Um, I think we had one uh, question over there. We How are we doing time. on time? Uh, we are out of time, unfortunately, but uh, we'll move you to the discussion zone okay. and uh, all the questions can be asked there. So, thanks. Thank you very much.